Irenaeus, Irenaeus. Irenaeus, Irenaeus. Irenaeus, Irenaeus. Oh, 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 Irenaeus. A <laughs> little bit of dorky levity to kick off an otherwise pretty heavy video. I would like to point out, I have tried I tried to shoot this video on on Friday and it failed to record. I tried to do it on Sunday, but time ran out before I had to go to work. I just tried, I was pretty much three quarters of the way through, and the phone rang. I, I, I don't know. Um, it, it's, it's as if, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm not really one of those conspiracy theorists that, like, dark angels are trying to stop me from doing something, but I, <laughs> if I was one of those kinds, I, I, I'd be saying it. So, anyway, yeah, Irenaeus. Anytime you confront a Catholic apologist about the evidence that points to there not being a single ruling bishop in the city of Rome, he is going to punt to St. Irenaeus, trusty, solid, reliable St. Irenaeus, who was the Padawan of St. Polycarp, who himself was the Padawan of St. John. And they're going to say, Mike, I would sooner take the word of Irenaeus whose feet were on the ground in the 2nd century, and who provided a list of all the popes in Against Heresies, Book 3, uh, Chapter 3, Section 3, versus a bunch of 21st century eggheads with some novel, hackneyed theory about there not being a pope in Rome. And on the surface, I totally understand what you're saying. Um, that, does, that does make a heck of a lot more sense. Now keep in mind, you are saying that you believe you know, the cleanest water, shall we say, runs the closest to the source, uh, runs, is the water that runs the closest to the source, in other words. You'd sooner take Irenaeus' account over people centuries removed from it. Keep that in mind. Now, I, I want to take a look at uh, Irenaeus. Some you know his list of the popes. Oh, I don't have it up anymore. It's in uh, against heresies. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Book three, chapter three, section three. Here's where he talks about Peter and Paul ordaining Linus, and then after Linus, Clement, or Anicetus, I believe it is. Um, then, uh, let's see, who else? Then Clement, Averistus, Averistus, Alexander followed Averistus, Sixtus followed Alexander, Telesphorus was gloriously martyred, then Hyginus, then Pius, then Anicetus. Uh, stupid computers, sing such a piece of junk. Anyway. Um, that's the list. This is the list that Irenaeus provides to us. So, here's the, here's the $64,000 question here. Was Irenaeus ever known to not do his homework and check into the facts of something he was passing along for the sake of repelling heresy? Well, part of the question can be part answered in the previous chapter. By indication that the tradition derived from the apostles of the very great, very ancient, universally known church, founded and organized at Rome by the two most glorious apostles, Peter and Paul. And also by, this is Irenaeus talking about, um, oh, why this church is the supreme church. And I'm probably going to do a video about this in a moment, you know, in the next couple of days, it has nothing to do with the fact that the Bishop of Rome, preside, the, the Vicar of Christ, presides there. We can get into the reasons why Irenaeus viewed the Church of Rome to be the Supreme Church on another occasion, but I, I want to look at what he said. Founded and organized at Rome by the two most glorious apostles, Peter and Paul. Founded by Peter and Paul. Huh? Um, let me ask you. Read the end of Acts when Paul arrives in Rome for his trial. 
Did Paul found the church in Rome, or were there not already Christians there? Read the end of Romans, chapter 16. I think it's, yeah, it's in 16. Where Paul is saying hello to everybody in the church of Rome. I mean, everybody. And this is what, in the late 50s he's writing this? And he leaves Peter out? I don't know. If Peter was in Rome, I'm pretty sure Paul would have, you know, give him a hello pretty much right off the bat. Peter and Paul did not found the church in Rome. You know, it, Peter didn't found it either. He got there at the end of his life, okay. But he didn't found the church in Rome. This is not my opinion. You know, Catholic scholarship will, will gladly concede that fact. So that's one time where Irenaeus didn't exactly do all his homework about, but probably repeated something that he heard about Peter and Paul founding the church in Rome. And and here's another example. Um, this is against Heresies, Book Two, Chapter Twenty Two, Sections Five and Six, and I cringe any time I read this. I I, I want to say that I hope that I can do one one hundredth as much for Christianity as, as Irenaeus did. I, I I have nothing but deep admiration for the guy. But I don't know what he was talking about here. He's talking about a Gnostic heretical group who said that Jesus only had a one-year ministry. And that's quite incorrect. But then he talks about how Jesus was 50 when he died. And he's saying that it's not just him saying this. He's saying that he, I guess there's people, he's saying that there's people who knew John. Who insist John gave him this information. That Jesus was 50 when he died. Um, he goes, you know, those who were conversant with, in Asia with John, the disciple of the Lord, affirming that John conveyed to them this information, he remained among them up to the time of Trajan. Some of them, moreover, not only saw John, but other apostles, and heard this very same account of them and bear testimony to the validity of that statement. Whom should we rather believe? In other words, the Gnostics, or these guys who actually knew the apostles. And then in chapter, section 6, he's talking about John 8, 56 through 58, where, you know, you're not yet 50 years old. Um, wouldn't it be more appropriate if he was not yet even 40? Wouldn't they have said, you're not even 40 years old and you've seen Abraham? And he's just, I, I don't know. This this is this is not one of Irenaeus' better moments where he's... he's talking about how Jesus had nearly a 20-year ministry and then he died. Clearly, Irenaeus was did not do his homework here and repeated stuff that he heard for the sake of repelling heresy. Um, uh, Irenaeus, I'm sorry, man. I, I look forward to seeing you in heaven and I hope you don't hold it against me when, when, when I get there. Um, but the truth is more important than... Than one man. Truth, truth is more important than Irenaeus. Um, okay. How dare I, though? Uh, how dare I throw Irenaeus under the bus for the sake of propping up my theology, for the sake of propping up this, this 20th century opinion? Well, I gotta point out, as a Catholic, you, you do, you, whether you know it or not, you have to do the same thing. How dare I throw Irenaeus under the bus as being deluded or confused? Well, you know, people like to trot Irenaeus out as believing in the real presence of, of Christ in the Eucharist. And I think anybody, you know, I think it's pretty easy to read his stuff and, and conclude that, yeah, he does. Here's the question. You know, Lutherans have no problem with real presence. Presbyterians have no problems with real presence. Anglicans have no problems with the idea of real presence. Here's the question. What kind of real presence did Irenaeus believe? Well, it sounded a heck of a lot more like consubstantiation than, uh, than what Catholics claim was the apostolic truth, that being transubstantiation. For as this bread which is produced from the earth when it receives the invocation of God is no longer common bread, but the Eucharist consisting of two realities, earthly and heavenly. In other words, the bread that was produced from the earth has a reality of being earthly, and it also has a heavenly reality. 
So our bodies, when they receive the Eucharist, are no longer corruptible, having the hope of the resurrection to eternity. Now, with this in mind, Irenaeus clearly here is is saying that the bread is still bread. It is all he also believes that Christ, you know, the the presence of Christ is in the bread because it has a heavenly reality. But this certainly isn't transubstantiation where the bread disappears and it only has the appearance of bread and it is in fact the body of Christ. And I want to show elsewhere if that is not enough. This is book five, uh, chapter 33. This is where he talks about, um, th this is where he talks about the wine in the Eucharist. Section one, sorry. Drink it. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for the remission of sins. I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Thus then, he will renew the inheritance of the earth. He will reorganize the mystery of the glory of his um, of his sons. As David said, he will renew the face of the earth. He promised to drink the fruit of the vine with his disciples, indicating both of these points. The inheritance of the earth was in which the new fruit of the vine is drunk, and the resurrection of his disciples in the flesh. For the new flesh which rises against again is the same which also received the new cup. It cannot be any mean, by any means understood as drinking the fruit of the vine when uh, settled down with his disciples in a super celestial place, nor again are they who drink it devoid of flesh. For to drink that which flows from the vine pertains to the flesh, not spirit. Now, this is clearly Irenaeus affirming that what is in the communion cup is wine. Is it all, you know, is the blood of Christ in the wine once the consecration occurs? Irenaeus would say yes. This is not Roman Catholic transubstantiation. Now, this is a guy who is two putts away from an apostle who was supposedly teaching transubstantiation, and yet Irenaeus, two putts away from John, teaches something more like consubstantiation, sac sacramental union. Um, and then one other thing about Irenaeus. Uh, let's head back to, this is in chapter 35 of book 5. You know, here, here's just the, the title of, he contends that these testimonies have already, that have already alleged cannot be understood allegorically of celestial blessings. They should have their fulfillment after the coming of Antichrist and the resurrection in the terrestrial Jerusalem. To the former prophecies, he subjoins others drawn from Isaiah, Jeremiah, and the Apocalypse of John. Irenaeus was a premillennialist. That's something that Roman Catholicism says cannot be safely taught, and they would deny that St. John was expressing any kind of a literal millennial reign on earth. Um, so you have the guy who wrote the book of Revelation. This guy is two putts away from the guy who wrote the book of Revelation. He, is, is, he believes that it is, in fact, speaking of a literal millennium, and... As a Catholic, you're going to have to say, well, I guess Irenaeus kind of got his facts skewed. So if Irenaeus got his facts skewed about the millennium and about transubstantiation, why couldn't he have gotten his facts skewed about and repeated information that he got somewhere else concerning the Bishop of Rome? I want to take a look at a book written by Roman Catholic Roger Collins about uh, the history of the papacy. It's called Keepers of the Keys of Heaven. And he says, It's suggested by the letters of Ignatius from the period of roughly A.D. 125 or 150, the emergence of a clerical hierarchy with special ritual functions and exclusive role in the leadership of their fellow believers was well underway, but by no means universally welcomed by all Christian groups. His letter to the Romans is particularly important in this respect because it helps confirm the process had hardly begun in the city of Rome at this time. Not only were there no bishops, as we understand the word, the time of Peter and Paul, they were actually slower to appear in Rome than almost any other part of the empire. Um, talks about how huge Rome is and how hard it would be to, in fact, have all Christians, shall we say, under one roof in the city. Um... 
Indications of this can be found in texts produced by Christian writers in Rome in the late 1st and 2nd century. The author of the Epistle of Clement may have been the man of this name, uh, later described as the person responsible for drafting communications sent on behalf of Christians in Rome to other churches. But by the time of Tertullian and Irenaeus, Clement was listed as a 2nd or 3rd bishop of Rome. The difference of perspective on Clement is telling. The late 2nd century authors were probably reporting a tradition that had grown up in Rome in which the leading figures amongst the elders of their day were retrospectively turned into bishops to produce a continuous list of holders of the office stretching back to Peter. Why this happened can be explained, but it would be helpful to ask which of the people named by Irenaeus and Tertullian should be regarded as the first real bishop of Rome in the city. Most scholars now agree that the answer would be Anicetus. Uh, who comes in 10th on both lists, whose episcopate likely covers the years 156, 155 through 156. Um, so that's that's from a Roman Catholic scholar. Is there an imprimatur on this book? No. Would scholarship that have imprimaturs on their books, like Raymond Brown, disagree with it? Not in the least. In other words, these lists of bishops were basically made up no, not made up, but they basically took prominent elders and made it look like, in a city that was besieged by heresy, this, this was the nest of Marcion, and all kinds of other screwy beliefs, look, stick with your bishop. He has ties back to the apostles. The heretics can't brag of it. That's really little more than it was. Now look, it's been said... You know, I'm going to trust Irenaeus, who was a lot closer to the source. Here's the thing. The Shepherd of Hermas was writing with his boots on the ground in the city of... Uh, Hermas was writing with his boots on the ground in the city of Rome. In probably anywhere between 115 to 145. Probably, probably I'm going to say, somewhere in the 130s. And he just makes... He makes passing, casual, disinterested mention of the body of elders, the presbyteros that plurally preside over the church, and that they squabble, they fight over the seats of honor in the church. Again, who's closer to the source and who is less biased? Hermas, who's making a passing mention of the body of elders that rule the church, or Irenaeus, who didn't always do his homework, and was likely repeating stuff that he heard for the sake of repelling heresy. Um, that's what it is. And it's not just me with a Protestant with a chip on his shoulder saying it. Roman Catholic scholarship with him, you know, who published books with imprimaturs on them would say it too.